So if you're happy producing the table that summarizes what debits and credits are, sort of by definition, the next stage is to apply that to some scenarios so that you can actually get the fluency with this that's the way that you really need in the exam. The first example we've got here are basically what are the debits and credits for a number of transactions. Now, before you do this, you need to remember the first stage, a debit, completely arbitrary name, basically is an asset in the statement of financial position. It tends to be easiest if you see a cash element of any of these transactions to look at the cash element first of all, because that kind of takes you by the hand and leads you through to a conclusion. We're all kind of instinctively fairly comfortable with cash. So therefore, if there is a cash transaction, build on that first of all. That will help you uh, get used to the transactions. It basically allows your brain to get comfortable with the whole thing. Now, that sounds kind of silly, but the way to learn double entry bookkeeping is to be okay-ish with the idea of what debits and credits are, but I'm not really comfortable really, if you can reach that stage. And then basically do it by repetition. I say the analogy I would draw is basically learning a practical skill like driving a car or something. Um, you can read books about driving a car forever, but there's no substitute to just kind of crunching the gears and stalling the car an awful lot of times before you actually get good at it. And it's exactly the same here. To learn how to drive a car pretty well, you've got to drive a car very, very badly at first. And the same is true of double entry bookkeeping. So if at first you became dispirited by not getting these things right, don't worry. That's just like the practical equivalent of driving a car and crunching the gears and, and um, virtually killing yourself. Um, sooner or later, you will learn how to not crunch the gears and now not to kill yourself. Same thing with double entry bookkeeping, but slightly less dangerous. So we have here, in the first example, we've got a scenario where we've received our net salary of $2,000 into our bank account. Now, the first thing to ask is, what are the assets and liabilities in this scenario? An asset is something you control that's going to give you an inflow of benefit by definition. Okay, well, what we have here is fairly obviously our bank account. Now, slightly confusingly, very often in questions, that's called cash. An actual cash and notes and coins is called petty cash. So if I call it cash or bank, don't get too disturbed. It basically is that your cash balances are either your own personal cash balances or cash balances held at the bank instead. Okay, so that's going direct into our bank account. Well, what's creating here, I think, is the question is, do we have any new assets? Well, yeah, we basically have an increase in our bank account. Does that create any new liabilities? No, it doesn't. Uh, you might actually find that you're reducing a liability because if you're overdrawn, then you're going to be reducing your bank overdraft rather than increasing an asset. Okay, Both would be a debit. A debit is either recognizing a new asset or increasing a new asset, or alternatively, reducing an existing liability. Okay, so we've got a bank account. There are any liabilities? Not really. No, assuming that we've got a normal bank account, this doesn't create any new liabilities. The act of receiving, the actual act of receiving our salary doesn't create any new liabilities. I might have some liabilities that I'm going to use that money to pay off, but that's a different transaction. That's what I'm going to do with the bank account at some stage later. So this first transaction here is basically the first question to ask yourself is what are the assets and liabilities? Well, here I've got a debit to bank and the net salary, the amount actually coming in, was $2,000. Now, for every credit, there's a debit. So my question is, has this created any new liabilities? No, nope, I don't think it has. As I mentioned earlier on, there may be existing liabilities, but the actual act of receiving my bank account doesn't, my, my net salary doesn't. We chose the word net here, by the way, because imagine if you're self-employed, receiving money, you might get paid that gross of tax, and the act of receiving it creates a liability for taxation. Okay, if you're thinking ahead to that, you're being cleverer than you're intended to be at this stage. Basically, if it's net salary, that means it's already been taxed. So literally, it's yours. It's all yours. So the credit, therefore, goes to income. So I'm going to say credit salaries income, or however else I might describe it, with $2,000. And I would like this reference here where you've got statement of comprehensive income. The statement of comprehensive income is always explainable as kind of a because statement. And there are quite a lot of textbooks out there that kind of say you've got you know, more bank because you've more income, or you've got less bank because you've got more expense on, on games and stuff, whatever you spent the money on. I personally find that incredibly illogical. The idea of having more of an expense it just never really feels right to me. I'm far more comfortable with the idea of saying that we've got less cash because I spent it on this. Or in this situation, we've got more money because I got paid my salary. That's the explanation for the increase in assets. Same to comprehensive income figures, always explainable using the word because. Okay, let's go back to the next one. Okay, we withdraw $100 at an ATM or a cash machine, whatever it's called in the country you, li you live in. Um, basically, a hole in the wall are called here in the UK quite often. <laughs> Uh, so you basically put in your card, uh, put in your PIN number, and take out $100. Uh, 
Now, as a result of that transaction, your bank account is going to go down, but you actually have $100 in your wallet to go off and spend on whatever you choose to spend it on. So in this situation, the question is, are there any new liabilities? Always start off in these things, particularly early on when you're learning bookkeeping, by saying what uh, new assets exist. Well, here, I think we've got debit cash, in other words, notes and coins, which we might call petty cash. And that's $100, which maybe isn't really all that terribly petty in terms of smallness, but you know what I mean. Okay, now, do we have any liabilities created here? No, we don't, um, unless, possibly, I might actually then be overdrawn at the bank, in which case, taking $100 out is going to increase my overdraft, that's going to increase the liabilities of the bank. Well, I'm going to say credit bank or credit overdraft. Now, this doesn't make me any richer, because that basically increases net assets, and that decreases net assets. Well, the definition of an income or expense is something that changes your net assets. So, here, I, I have the same overall wealth at this point. Now, generally speaking, when I personally go to a cash machine and take out $100, I'm generally no more than a few paces away from the nearest bar where I'm going to actually use that and exchange it for beer. But at the actual point where I take the money out, even though I know perfectly well it's going to disappear quite soon, at that point, before I make those three or four paces into the nearest bar, I'm actually no worse off. So, therefore, I'm saying debit bank, sorry, correction, debit cash and credit bank for that very short few steps. I'm no poorer, therefore, there is no item going to uh, income or expenditure. Let's take a look at the next one. You spend $10 on lunch. So, in this scenario, I managed to take those five steps past the nearest bar and I spent it instead on something altogether more wholesome and healthy. So here I'm saying credit cash or petty cash because a debit is an asset. Well, the act of spending it reduces that asset. So if I say downward arrow reduces NA, NA here is net assets. Okay, have I created any new assets? Well, actually kind of yes. I mean, if you go out and you buy lunch, um, let's say $10 would be relatively expensive lunch, I guess, but suppose you go somewhere and you buy the world's best quality sandwich and you look at it, for a little while it's an asset. Okay, So for a little while you've taken the asset of cash and you've exchanged it for the world's best soup and sandwich. You know, $10 worth, it seems to be quite expensive lunch. Okay, but it's not going to be an asset for very long, so it's simply not worth recording that as an asset in your accounting system. So we're just going to say debit expense. Okay, for a little short period of time it's an asset, but it's going to disappear so quickly that we'll just record it as an expense because lunch sits in front of you in my case, it doesn't really, at the time that somebody puts lunch in front of me, that lunch doesn't have a whole long time to live because, you know, I'm going to merge with that lunch and I'm going to, I'm going to win. So, therefore, I'm going to say debit expense because that explains where that cash went to. Now, that basically is the kind of because explanation. So, here, what we're saying is our credit cash, our net assets went down because I bought lunch and I didn't keep it, I didn't keep it as an asset, I ate it. And at that point, the asset no longer existed, therefore that caused me to become poorer, therefore it's an expense. Okay, now what you should do in each of these scenarios here, I started this, what you should do now is kind of pause the recording, I think we've probably got the idea here a little bit, and then kind of have a go, and then start the recording again, and then I'll explain it. So, have a go at part four, I will just keep talking. You need to use the, re the pause button um, on the screen here um, to be able to stop me and then basically have a go at it. Remember if you get it wrong that's only the equivalent of crunching the gears when you first start to learn driving. Okay so have a go at number four. And here's my answer to number four. Okay at number four we are giving two dollars to a beggar in the street. Okay and there's always going to be a debit and credit. Sometimes by the way the debits and credits might be to more than one actual record. It could be you're doing more than one thing at once. It's not true that every debit has to have an equal and exact opposite credit just means in any transaction the total debits will equal the total credits. We'll come back to that later on. Now if I've paid two dollars, okay, that makes me poorer in fine financial terms. I'm sorry, it's not ten dollars, well, it's two dollars. So therefore that's decreasing net assets. Do I have any new assets as a result of this transaction? Uh, the answer is no, I don't, because of the fact that I've given that money to the beggar. I have a nice warm feeling inside, I suppose, the fact that I've done something virtuous and something good. But the fact is that that's not really something that I control. And remember, the definition of an asset is something that you control that's going to give you an inflow of benefit. You don't really control that beggar's life, and therefore this is an expense, because as far as you're concerned, you've become poorer. So therefore, debit expense, $2, because our net assets went down. It's the explanation of where our net assets went to. 
Okay, have a go at item five. And here's my answer to item five, which is you found, so you found that the other eight dollars that you had had been stolen or maybe you'd lost it or whatever else. Either way, basically what we have here is now less cash. So I'm going to say credit cash. It's conventional, by the way, for some reason to put debits first. Um, I should have said that. I don't know why that should be the case, but that's the way it, people generally do it. We uh, say debit, ca debit, whatever it might be first, even though the credit transaction might be the kind of first thing that you identify here. Um, you notice the actual order of what things happen is you think, where's my cash gone? Where's that eight dollars? And you kind of search every pocket and you look around and we all know that feeling and eventually you recognize that that eight dollars is no longer under your control and therefore you have to de-recognize it so therefore the credit is the thing that you identify first of all um it's just weirdly i've genuinely no idea why it's conventional to draw the debits first uh, if you find that disturbing just draw the credit first just write out the credit item first of all whichever is the first thing that you identify okay well here we've got eight dollars the question is has this created any new assets well, I guess for whoever's lucky enough to find the $8, yes, it has created an asset, but for me it definitely hasn't. And therefore, I'm going to have to create some sort of record here, and I'm going to kind of say kind of, you know, theft or loss, um, you know, abnormal loss of property. Now, you can record as many because explanations in your accounting system as you think are useful. Um, what most businesses will do is say, the vast majority of the because statements, in other words, what explains where the assets come in from or where they go to, maybe 99% of transactions are covered uh, by the same 25 explanations. I, I really don't know, maybe a bit more than that. So you end up generally having records for things that you expect to happen all the time. And for small items like this, you probably just create an item called sundry expenses because they're not likely to be recurring and they're not likely to be very high. It's absolutely your choice how you do this. Okay, but nonetheless, we lost $8, we had to de-recognise it, therefore it became an expense. Have a go at item 6. Okay, and item 6, we go out and buy a camcorder, that's a camera that's uh, also a video recorder. Um, in other words, it's something that's going to give us a benefit for more than one period. Now, as a result of this transaction, do we have an asset? Yes, we do. So I'm going to say debit non-current assets. We'll look at non-current assets later on. A non-current asset is something that you're expecting to give you benefit over more than one accounting period. Now, a camcorder is an expensive piece of kit. It's cost $800 here. I'm certainly expecting that to give me some benefit. Now, the moment you buy it, you look at it, that's a wonderful thing of a new toy that's in a new box. Um, it's, it's brand new. It's going to give you a life of a certain number of years. So let's say, for example, you expect it to work for five years before it breaks down. What you're going to do is basically say each year you have a fifth of that benefit of the $800, the original cost. And that's the thing that we call depreciation. We'll look at that later on in the course. But here, at the actual moment when you get the thing and it's still in the box and it's still brand new, the thing actually has a value of $800. And the reason for that is because, well, we've not paid any cash here. What we've done is paid by credit card. Now, the new asset we recognize, you say, okay, I've got a new asset here. I've got a camcorder. That's a debit because it's an asset. There must be a credit to something. Now, credits are either income or expense, sorry, income or liabilities. Well, this isn't income because it's not like somebody gave me that. The reason is I've got a credit card liability. I don't actually have to pay it right away, but I will have to pay it. And at the moment that I do that transaction, I've got a credit card liability of 800. Now it could be, I don't know the rules are wherever you're looking at this recording, maybe using a credit card actually in, involves a transaction cost as well. I can think, for example, one of my cards that I use, each time I have a transaction on it, it the bank are gonna bill me $1. So in that situation, I should probably say debit non-current assets, credit liability 801, and I'd also have a debit expense of $1 for actually using the card. Now, you need to know what the transactions are and actually what the rules are, you know, what you're committed to each time you record a transaction. The double entry is literally recording transactions. It's a means of recording them. It doesn't actually tell you what the transactions themselves are. Okay, so I'd be happy with this idea that basically it's not an expense. The reason it's not an expense is it's an expense that will give me a period over a number of years. So that's called a non-current asset. And we've got credit card liability because we didn't pay in cash. Have a go at item seven. 
Okay, in item 7, this is the happy situation where I'd absolutely given up on the uh, $8 that I thought I'd lost, and now I found that I actually have it. So, what I need to say is de debit cash because I have some money that I didn't think I had. Well, that makes me richer than I thought I was. That's an increase in net assets. The explanation for that, well, in reality, you'd probably just reverse out your previous journal because we said loss expense. Now, as it turns out, I didn't need that. Now, this is something called a change in accounting estimates because we felt previously that we'd lost that money and the correct thing to do was to write it off as an expense. We now discover actually that still exists. So, therefore, I'm going to say credit loss expense because it's an adjustment to the previous one. You could alternatively kind of have an out and say credit kind of unexpected income. You can, you know, there are as many different accounting records here as there are ways of saying because. Um, here we've got eight dollars in cash because actually my previous uh, belief that I'd lost that money was wrong. So if I'd said debit loss to record a loss, actually, I'm not going to go back in time. I can't go back and kind of change that journal, kind of scratch it out. The way we do that is to put through the opposite journal to get us back to zero as if it had never happened. Okay, have a go at item eight. Okay, item eight is where we are receiving some money from my brother. In this situation, I'm assuming that he's actually paying me in cash. So I'm going to say debit cash with the notes and coins of 120. So in other words, that's increased my net assets. Well, the thing you're looking for here is always a because statement. How come, you know, what's the reason for those net assets going up? Well, the reason is because the fact that that person who owed me money, in this situation my brother, has actually repaid me. Now, previously, I must have recorded this as a receivable. In other words, often called a debtor in different uh, parts of the world. In IS1, uh, we should call it receivables, really. But if somebody owes you money, you recognize that, that they are an asset because there's an obligation on them to pay you some cash. So what we're doing here is kind of swapping one asset for another asset. We're swapping a receivable, which isn't quite as liquid as actual cash, but it is nonetheless an asset, for cash itself. So there's not, that doesn't make me any richer or poorer because previously when I saw my brother I thought, I didn't see my brother, I saw a person who is $120 to me. And now he's basically given me $120 so he's come back to being worthless <laughs> um, to me but instead I've now got $120. Clearly I'm not suggesting brother is actually worthless here but you know what I mean, there's no actual immediate value in income because he no longer owes me the money. If he'd paid me half of that then I'd still be showing my brother as a receivable of $60 because if he paid me half of it, I'd see the $60 in my hand and I'd see him and I'd kind of see a $60 sign on top of his head because that's what he owes me. Okay, here he's paid the entire lot, so it's just going to credit cash, sorry, credit receivables and debit cash. Have a go at item number nine. Okay, in item nine, we're getting into the big league here. Um, I borrowed some money. Now, normally when you borrow a large amount of money to buy a home, we've borrowed $100,000, that's going to go into my bank account. The, um, actually, you've got to go through all the paperwork, of course, to prove your income and stuff, and eventually they give you some money. But they invariably actually put it into your bank account in the first instance. Now, my bank account has gone up. That's going to increase net assets by $100,000, which is uh, what's technically known as a very large amount of money. And therefore, there must be some reason for that. Now, that is not a gift from the bank. It's not income. The reason it's there is because of the fact that I've got a loan, which is a liability. So I've not, at this point, actually become any richer or poorer. I've become more liquid. I've got cash that I can spend on stuff, in this situation a home, plus maybe some home furnishings and so on, but I've got to pay that back. Now, therefore, the overall net effect of that transaction is it hasn't changed my net assets at all, and therefore I'm no richer and no poorer. So therefore there's no income, there's no expense. Income is not the same as cash flow. Okay, this is the reason we've got income is often the same as cash flow, but is not necessarily the same thing as cash flow. In this situation, we've got a cash inflow, but the reason we've got a cash inflow is because I owe somebody else that money. So the creation of that loan makes me a hundred thousand dollars poorer. So therefore no asset position, no income, no expenditure. It's simply a creation of a new asset, a bank account, because we've created a new liability. Have a go, last one of all, item 10. Okay, 
My item 10 is saying this. Well, I'm presumably paying $100,000 out from the bank account. I mentioned earlier it's conventional put the debit items first of all. I'm genuinely not really quite sure why, but it is. And therefore that is going to decrease my net assets. I'm just going to put the credit item here first because it's literally the first transaction that happens. So I've got $100,000 poorer. Now, basically, if you suddenly become $100,000 poorer, your first thought is why? Okay, and that's answered by a because. So if I've got transactions to credit bank, there must be a debit item that explains the kind of because. Well, the because is because of the fact that I've got a new home, which is basically a non-current asset. Now, that non-current asset is going to be the place I'm going to live for quite a long time. And I'm told here that that gave me an expense of 99000 Okay, the other because statement is I've got legal fees. Now, we'll look at this later on. In fact, you'd actually show the net asset probably basically is just the sum of those two, actually. But nonetheless, here, let's, for the sake of simplicity, just to illustrate the point, let's say that that 99000 basically increases net assets. And the legal fees, imagine that they don't. You say, well, those legal fees don't actually add to the value of the asset at all. They're therefore an expense. Okay, now... This illustrates the point that an awful lot of accounting standards actually are about saying whether something is an expense or whether it's treated as an asset. Expenses feel like bad news, assets feel like good news. So therefore, there's a natural tendency to want to call everything assets rather than expenses. I'm sure it won't surprise you to discover that therefore there are quite a lot of accounting standards that push us towards recognising things as an expense rather than recognising them as assets. Okay, now those are examples. The best thing you can do here, I think the notes say, the best thing you can do at this point is get together with somebody else who's studying this paper. I just come up with a load of transactions. Go through what you did that day in terms of, you know, transactions you put in your credit card, if you have a credit card, at things that happened in your bank account, um, or imagine that you're running a business, the transactions that could happen, and agree what the double entry journals are. The best way of doing this really is just to practice it until you're getting them right, let's say, for example, about 80% of the time, and then it's time to move on. So, summary so far, do that table. Be familiar with that table. That really, really helps. Then go through this example. Make sure you're happy with the reasons why. Make up some examples with somebody else. And then we'll start looking at how we record these debits and credits, which themselves are slightly arbitrary, in an equally arbitrary thing called a T-account.